Amen. Thank you very, very much. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. What a great privilege it is to be a part of what God is doing, and it is my honor to be able to not only preach the gospel, but especially on a Thursday evening to challenge you for the nations of the earth. A woman named Irina Sendler was a so social worker in uh, Warsaw, Poland. When the Germans invaded in 1939, she began personally organizing financial and material help for the Jews. This woman uh, understood, uh, finally, that the, the Germans meant nothing less than the utter destruction of every Jew in Warsaw, including children. And with her access to the Jewish ghetto, she began persuading parents that uh, their children had a far better chance of living if they would let her smuggle them out of the ghetto and place them with Catholic families. This is what she did, an incredible story, all the ways that uh, she got them out. She smuggled out 2,500 children by herself. She was informed on, the Germans arrested her and tortured her horribly. They beat her, broke her feet, broke her legs, but she would not reveal where the children were. She would not betray the children. After the war ended, she was asked, Irina, why would you be willing to go through such terrible torture for this? And she said these powerful words. She said the children, talking about the children that she saved, the children are the justification of my existence on this earth. In other words, she's saying that there is a purpose in life larger than me. That is why I was put on this earth. In the scripture that we're going to read here, God comes down to Abram. Here is the beginning of a covenant relationship that God has with his people. And in our scripture, he begins and reveals that Abram, anyone in covenant relationship with God, you have a purpose that is far larger than you. And he gives the scope of it. He says you are to touch all of the families of the earth. We literally are called to impact unto the ends of the earth. This calling is upon every one of us. And I want to preach about the ends of the earth from Genesis chapter 11, starting at verse 29. If you want to follow along with me, the Bible says, Now Abram and Nahor, they took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father uh, of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran, and they dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of your country, out of your kindred, and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse him that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran, the ends of the earth. I want to begin by looking for a moment at the thought of purpose. One of the mistakes of modern Christianity is building churches around personal preference. They will build churches uh, on uh, whatever they think is uh, 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 preferable to them, whether that's social justice or children's education or praise and worship or political involvement. But the real need as we're gathered here in conference is simply to discover the heart of God. And uh, when we discover the heart of God, we have to find out what it is that God loves. We have to find out what is his passion 
and align our hearts with God's heart. We have to make sure that we love what He loves and that we have to make His passion ours and build our lives and churches accordingly. Now this scripture is foundational to covenant relationship with God. And God speaks uh, uh, to Abram, and from the beginning, he revealed to him that his love and his concern is worldwide. In verse 3, he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You see, the heart of God <coughs> is moved by human need and suffering in other nations. We read in the Old Testament of God who is willing to work with a disobedient and a prejudiced and a whining prophet named Jonah. And because it was not about Jonah, but it was the heart of God that was at stake. And in the end of the book of Jonah, chapter 4, he comes down the story of the gourd. It's Jonah's comfort. And he says to him, Jonah... There are 120,000 people in this city. This is a foreign country. And he says they do not know their right hand from their left. In other words, they have no clue of what is about to come upon them in judgment. He says, should not my heart be moved? One translation says, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? It is the heart of God that he was trying to reveal. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, visibly demonstrating the heart of God. Jesus said in John 10, 16, For I have uh, other sheep that are not in this flock. I must bring them also. He says in one of the parables, the field is the world. And one time uh, 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 when they were having great success, uh, here's the feeding of the multitudes. Immediately after that, he says, let us go to the other side. Why? We're having tremendous uh, uh, numbers here. We're touching. But you see, on the other side is Decapolis. Uh, these are ten cities uh, that were dominated by the Romans uh, and the Greeks. These were foreigners that were looked down upon by the Jews. Uh, but Jesus says, that is where I want to go, is the other side, uh, because he's showing the heart of God. John 4.4 4 says, and... Jesus said he must needs go through Samaria. This is not a routing issue. He could have gone another direction. He could have taken another route. But this is a, an, an imperative of love. Jesus is saying, I have to go to Samaria. Samaria, this is the place that Jews despised. They were foreigners. But Jesus is trying to convey his heart. He says, I have to go there. See, it is never God's intention that relationship with him only be localized. Many of you are having the favor of God in a local area. That's why we hear these reports. We rejoice with you about what God is doing in a local area. But our scripture tells us that is never God's intention. That it simply stop there. What needs to happen is to lift up our eyes. To look farther or higher to see the need in distant places. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, For you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. Listen to me. What we're doing here tonight in world evangelism is not a program. It's a passion of God. Lamentations 1.12, it speaks about suffering. And he says, Is it nothing to you who pass by? God is saying, Can you walk by? human suffering and it not mean anything to you? It not move you? A man named Tom Clegg, he went as a missionary to a refugee camp on the Kenya Ethiopian frontier. He said his first job of the day was burying all those who had starved to death the previous day. He said in the camp as they, uh, uh, they came they, they, they only had capacity to feed 20,000 no more. That's all they could feed per day. 
And he says the math of that was very painful because far more than 20,000 would come every day to eat. And he said during peak times, each refugee would only get a real meal probably every 10 days. He said his job after burying those who starved to death was to stand out in the sun and literally physically count 19,999 20,000 and that is all they could feed it was his job they had to physically push everyone outside the fence and then shut the barbed wire fence he says this is is tearing him up uh, he said he would weep looking at them uh, staring through the fence and he would he would be crying saying I'm sorry you can't eat today said so when he first got to the camp he went back into after the end of one of these days telling all the other people outside the fence they couldn't eat, he came into the workroom where all the workers, they're, they're laughing, they're eating their evening meal, they're joking, having a great time. He said, something snapped. He's looking at these people. He said, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? There are people outside the fence that are starving to death. And you're laughing and joking? I wonder if God looks down from heaven sometimes at us and says that. Are you crazy? You're so excited about what God's doing in your area. But outside the fences of our nations are people who are starving for the word of God. This is God's heart. It is his passion. God reveals to Abram his purpose. Because of his passion, he says, your purpose, Abram, is to reach the nations. In these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. See, missions didn't begin with John 3.16 or Matthew 28 or Mark 16. Here is the beginning. This is the foundation. This is the beginning of a covenant people. They have no laws. They have no temple. They have no structure, but they do have a mandate. From the beginning, before anything else, he says... This is your purpose. All of the families of the earth are to be touched. Psalm 67 verse 2 says, So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Jesus said uh, that your house uh, shall be a house of prayer for all nations. This is not a side issue with God. This is not just one of the many things that we may do. Uh, this is a, a, a mandate that is e given to everyone uh, who is of the seed of Abraham. We are spiritual seed. Uh, this mandate is passed on to us. Uh, every believer, every pastor, uh, every church must be involved involved in the heart of God which from the beginning he says is nothing less than worldwide all of the families of the earth whether that is praying supporting giving or going we must be involved in the purposes of God Hudson Taylor said I used to ask God to help me then I asked if I might help him and I ended up asking God to do his work through me that's what the scripture says he reveals to Abram this is my heart this is my passion therefore your purpose is to carry that passion to the nations of the earth I want to look at secondly at the principle of involvement the focus in the call and in the promise that we have here is on God actually God says, I will show you, I will make you, I will bless, and I will curse. In other words, God says, I am personally involved, I am actively involved in the earth to see my will accomplished because God is the Lord of the harvest. Think about how God is involved in world evangelism. Number one, God is involved in political systems. We read in the Old Testament the same strange scripture. It says, Cyrus, his anointed. Cyrus is a heathen, demon-possessed, violent, pervert king. God says, he's my servant. He's my anointed. In other words, God is saying, I work in nations. 
often what looks like a tragedy is actually God intervening to accomplish his will. There was a time when communism was one of the greatest threats in the world. It, it's amusing now to read old Christian books and the greatest threat in the world was communism. Governments were toppling and one of the reasons why this was going to be so bad was because if the communists take over, that's it. Those people can never be saved. They've locked them up. Pastor Mitchell read uh, the email from uh, uh, Sergei uh, uh, Golubev uh, and the church in, in uh, Vologda, Russia that just planted the church into Hanoi, Vietnam. Listen to this again. It says, our couple Andre and Olia landed in Vietnam three days ago. They had no problems crossing the border. No one even checked their luggage. People are very open to talk to tall white people from Russia. Russians apparently are still very popular in Vietnam. There was a time when people would have looked and said, the Russians have influenced Vietnam. How will we ever reach Vietnam? But you see, God is involved in the earth. And now God is able to intervene and use that to work his will. Not only that, God involves himself in people migrations. It's one of the major factors in the world today. I believe someone has spoken in one way or another every night about this. The scattering of people from their home nation to other nations. There are hundreds upon multiplied hundreds of millions who live outside the nation of their birth. This may come because a political despot takes over and begins to oppress people. This may come because of economic collapse, because of a lack of educational opportunity. But here there are people that for one reason or another, hundreds of millions, they've scattered throughout the earth. They do not live in the nation where they're born. And I want to tell you, God is behind that. Because for whatever reason, here are people who have wound up in another nation. They are open to change. And many of the people have spoken this week. What happens in the new nation that they're living in is now they're confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Several of the men this week have spoken about, you know, I'm the only white man in the church. You know, God does that not just to teach white boys what it feels like to be a minority. But here is what is happening is people come in to our churches here and are confronted with the gospel. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, it lists for us 15 different nationalities. This is the birthing of the church. It is not an accident that on the day when all of these nationalities were gathered together in Jerusalem, that is the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out. Why? Because that is God's purpose for the church. He brings people from other nations to our nations so that they can be confronted with the gospel. They get saved. They have a natural burden for their home country. They speak the language. They have contacts and passports because this is the will of God. The first night we had Marcus Samuel. He spoke about how he came to America. He's going to, uh, 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 this is going to be economically advantageous to live in America. He's not going to be limited in India, but God met him in America. Saved, discipled in Phoenix, Arizona, and God laid upon his heart to go back to the nation of his birth where he is reaching. That is the heart of God. I preached last month in Sydney, Australia, here in the congregation. I don't know, we probably had a little more than a hundred people there per service. I asked Pastor Rob Walsh to count for me. Here in, in this group of people are 22 nations of the earth. I'm not talking about people back to the fourth, the, you know, the five century. I'm talking about people who are direct from another country. 22 nations of the earth and they're hearing the gospel in Australia so that they can be touched. Why? Because God says, I, this is my passion. I want you to be involved in it, but I am at work. It's the heart of God. This is not how smart we are. This is not the program that we thought up. This is how 
wonderful God is. We also see that God involves himself in human lives. That he personally and he supernaturally calls a man in our scripture to reach the nations. Verse 1 says, leave your country and go to a land I will show you. Verse 3 says, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Jonah heard the call of God, arise and go to Nineveh. Acts 16, 9, during the night Paul had a vision of, of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. I moved to the nation of Australia when I was 17. I met my wife there, we got married in Australia. I will never forget in a conference, it probably was 1983. In this conference, they were showing one of the early conference videos. We weren't in a lot of nations in 1983. We would have had some footage from Mexico, a little bit of footage from Europe, little bit of footage from Africa and we had very powerful footage from the Philippines. The major emphasis of this video was the Philippine. I mean it was tear jerking, gut rent, it was powerful. And while I'm watching this movie from the Philippines, my heart is broken for Africa. How is it you watch a movie about the Philippines and you're called to Africa? Now, I admit that may be evidence I'm a little slow geographically. <laughs> but you see, God personally comes down and he touches hearts. No doubt there were men that would have been touched for Europe and Asia and other nations because God is Lord of the harvest and he calls people. Several men have mentioned a, a sermon I've preached uh, the heavenly vision it talks about just lays out simply the story really is all it is the story of our fellowship where we came from at the end of it I asked several questions where would you like to see in your home country churches planted then I asked what nations of the earth would you like to see churches and I asked people to participate in this what fascinates me is the nations that people speak and I often wonder why is that nation on your heart? Now, if you're from Peru and you say, I want a church in Peru, I can understand that naturally. But there are people who have no connection with a nation. I believe everywhere I've gone, somebody has said Kazakhstan. That fascinates me. Why? Why is Kazakhstan on your heart? Because God is the Lord of the harvest. I've had people come up to me and tell me that they were reading the newspaper and saw a mention of a nation having never heard of that nation before and they said something caused me I have begun to investigate this nation why because the Lord of the harvest God says I will I will this is the heart of God because God inspires and burdens and he calls I want to look at one last thought. I want to talk about response. If this is the passion and the purpose and the involvement of God, I want you to understand that our involvement is conditional. See, the Jews have failed up till now in their national purpose. They did not care about the nations and they would not release blessings. Tonight, a Gentile is standing before you, challenging you for the nations. In part, because the Jews would not. Now, in verse 1, it says, now the Lord had said. This was not God's first conversation with, with Abram. Acts chapter 7 verse 2 and 3 tells us of God's calling that was previous to chapter 12. And in Genesis 11, I began there because it gives us a list of Abram's relatives. And in his relatives, we see here types of people who will not respond 
to the heart of God and to the purpose of God. We see first of all his brother Nahor. Nahor is representative I believe of those who stay. Now we often talk about those who stay in a good sense, people who stay and pray and give to make it possible. I'm not using this in a good sense. Get a picture of this. They're living in Mesopotamia. This is idol worshiping country. This is where they worship the moon god. These people were precursors to Muslims. One day, Nahor's brother Abram comes home. He, this must have been an exciting moment. God spoke to me. His name is Jeho. God talked to me personally. And he begins to tell him that God told me, we can touch all of the families of the earth. His father was inspired by this. But you see, Nahor, his name means to snort or literally to snore. He could hear God spoke. God has a purpose for the nations of the earth. And it didn't mean anything to him. He was not moved by human need. He was not stirred to obey God. He preferred to stay in Ur where it is familiar and where it is comfortable. And right there is one of the problems of why the world has not been one. You know, people die, 110 people die every minute. Since we started conference Monday night at 7 o'clock, 458,100 people have died, and the majority of those are on their way to hell. It's far worse than that. They estimate that every hour, 1,342 people die without ever hearing about Jesus Christ one time. See, that's not fair. You're absolutely right, that's not fair. Are, are people who've never heard going to be saved? No, but that's not the issue. If you know that people are going to hell and we don't do anything about it, are we saved? Since we came to prayer tonight at 5 o'clock, Nearly 2,300 people have gone into eternity. They're in hell right now, and they've never heard one time. We have enjoyed. We've heard sermon after sermon after sermon, and they've never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. But Nahor is one who that doesn't move him. That doesn't stir him. We still have 136 countries in which we do not have even one fellowship church. 1.7 billion people who don't have the advantage of what we have. Think about some of the great nations that we don't even have a church in. The nation of Sri Lanka. 20 million people. We don't have one church. Madagascar. 20 million people. Uzbekistan, 26 million people. Cambodia, 12 million people. Not even one church who believes like we believe. And then we have nations in which we have only one. The nation of Italy, we have one church that I believe is primarily reaching Filipinos. 56 million people. One church. Is there not one person in this great congregation who would be stirred for the nation of Italy? Portugal, 185 million people, and we have one church? There are men here, you already speak Spanish. It would not be a stretch for you to learn Portuguese and go to Brazil. Would there not be people here who your heart could be stirred? But Nahor is a snorer. Only concerned with what is comfortable and familiar. Listen to me. 
One of the things that trips people up is the thought of a specific call. I often ask people, because I've spent much of my life overseas, I ask people, I want to know, have you ever been called overseas? And often the response is, no, I've never been called. And that's, that's fine, because I'm not the caller. But you know what that often means in their heart? Is that God has never come and said, I want you to go to this nation in this city, and you shall live at 2195 Bluebird Lane in a white house with yellow trim. <laughs> Thus say the Lord. No, I've never been called. Listen to me. If it is true what I just spoke, just a smattering of people who are dying, the need is a call. Okay, so you haven't got the exact nation and a light from heaven, but do not the nations of the earth cry out? It's interesting to me in Acts 13, here's the Holy Spirit giving a specific call, separate uh, for me um, Barnabas uh, and, and uh, Paul for the purpose in which I've chosen. That's the specific call. In Acts 16, he gets a vision, not of God saying, I want you to go to Macedonia, but it's very interesting, he gets a vision of a man begging, please come and help us in Macedonia. The need was calling Paul. There have been many men for everyone who's heard a specific call, yes, I need to go to that nation. There have been many who said, I don't have a specific call, but I do believe we have to do something about the nations of the earth, and I would be willing to go. And when they have done that, then God has revealed His will. The need is a call. I want to tell you people like Nahor are forgotten. He is a footnote in Bible history. Nahor, brother of Abram, and he's finished. You know why? Because if you're a snorer, if human need and the purposes of God cannot move you, you will never move other people. You will never have men who will be stirred under your ministry by your decisions. If you, my brother, are seeking the familiar and the comfort zone, do not be surprised if the people sitting in your congregation are not stirred by the need and the purpose of God. Abram's father, Terah, here's the second type of person who will not respond. Not only are those who stay, but Terah is representative of those who stop. Terah was Abram's father. He apparently was stirred by this story. His son, his eyes must have been shining. God spoke to me, the nations of the earth, because the Bible says that Terah says, let's go. And they began on the journey to the promised land of Canaan. They got 500 miles, but you see, what happens to people after an initial stirring is Terah must have been, now they're trudging on foot through hot desert. He must have begun to think, this was a crazy idea. Abraham, are, are, are you sure it was God who spoke to you? This is what happens at conference. Monday night, there are people at the altar, oh God, oh God. And they go out and eat. <laughs> there are people at conference who were powerfully stirred. Maybe on a Thursday night of the video, they came to this very altar and said, Yes, God, yes, I will. And then they go home. And on the way home, they begin to talk to their wife and they say, But you know, the kids are, they're at a very crucial age right now. And after all, if we just waited and got our financial situation a little more settled, and by the next conference, it's all drained away. And the Bible says they came to Haran and they stopped. Man, you're on the road. And he stops in Haran. Listen to me, the Bible says he died in Haran. People who stop who do not follow through on those stirring. Listen to me, you can die in Haran. Haran means parched. This is where vision dies. 
There are people who come to conference and do not feel a thing. Nothing moves them anymore because at some point in the past, God moved upon them and they stopped. And now their souls have dried up. Their ministries have dried up. And other people who were lesser men than them but said, I will go on. God brought them into their destiny. We see Abram, he actually is a picture, another type of person who does not respond. Abram is a picture initially of those who stumble. The call was clear. And the call of God was leave your family and go. And Abram says, yes, Lord, I will. And he takes his family with him. This is a picture of people who are willing to obey, but they want to set the terms. They want to determine the limits. They know an offering is coming up. They're willing to give. They're not they're going to go, absolutely not. They're willing to give, but they're going to but not that much. They say, I will go, but not there. They say, I'll go, but only if. You know, we've had some generous souls through the years who have said to Pastor Mitchell, I would be willing to go if I could have the conference church. Oh, you large-hearted brother. <laughs> You're determining. You're trying to set terms. Rather than whatever God has listened to me. Nothing good happens with limited obedience. Limited obedience is not good enough. I'll go, but I'm taking the family with. But that's not what God told you to do. We see here finally that Abram then, thank God we don't leave him there. Abram then is the t a picture of those who surrender. He lays down his purpose for a higher purpose. This involves two very simple principles. Number one, it is the principle of going. Genesis 12, 1, the Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, your father's household and Go to the land that I will show you. So you have to leave things. We cannot reach the world by staying in our home countries. That's the bottom line. I just read a book. It's called On Call in Hell. It tells about Commander Richard Jadick. He's a Navy medic. His job is to save lives. And when the Iraq war broke out, he understood that if our purpose is saving lives, then why do we stay far away from the battle where it's safe? And he began to talk to higher up. If our job is to save lives, what are we doing back here? If we're to save lives, shouldn't we be there? And he persuaded them. And he set up in Fallujah in the middle of bombs and bullets and snipers taking shots of that is where he set up because he understood if we're going to save lives somebody has to go it can be done no other way Matthew 28 go into all the world Isaiah 6 verse 8 I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and then said I here am I send me it's interesting in, in the scripture to me that Abram says nothing to God the reason why I find that interesting is because sometimes talking about our purpose is deceptive it's therapeutic to talk about it. There are people who talk about it and that makes them think they're doing it. We got World Evangelism on our website. You see the sign? Oh, local church with a worldwide vision. We are doing it, man. <laughs> David Barrett, Todd Johnson in a book called Our Globe and How to Reach It. They said, in our opinion, 
The greatest enemy of world evangelization is Christian rhetoric. The continual discussing, arguing, and endless talking and preaching about evangelizing the world without any of the crucial implementation. He says, you've got to do it. Don't just talk about it. Somebody's got to go. I asked Pastor Mitchell while we're on the platform. Last night, Pastor Payne preached a masterpiece. 50 feet from revival. The trailer is there. And I said to Pastor Mitchell, and how many men came and spoke to you today about the nations? None. Two and a half thousand people. And there's not one person here who said, I will go? <laughs> how can that be? The second principle is the principle of financing. From the beginning, God's plan deliberately involves a financial element. God says, I will bless you. I, God says, I bless my people. We see a supernatural dimension that is at, of, of favor that is at work even in the Jews even unto this day. But it is very clear from the beginning of God's covenant relationship, financial blessings are to be used for aiming resources for God's passion, which is reaching all of the families of the earth. The Jews became repositories rather than channels of blessing. Listen to me. As we bring it to a close, what we're going to do at the conclusion of the video, you know what we're going to do. We're going to announce some workers, then Pastor Mitchell is going to take an offering. I, I cannot emphasize to you enough that our finances can mean the difference between life and death. Let me tell you a story as I close. Reading about two friends, they grew up, New Jersey lived four doors from each other. In high school, Vinnie Rico, he worked three jobs for some months to buy a high school class ring. If you're not from America, this is common that they have a, a, a class ring. I'm holding one here. A brother in our congregation, this has the emblem of the school. It has a, a stone with an initial, a person's initial. Vinny Rico worked three jobs for months to buy one of these. And he went and he showed it to his best friend, Bill Hayes. He showed us it, look at that, man. He was so proud of this. World War II broke out. Both Vinny and Bill, they went in, they, they joined the military. Both wound up being stationed in the Philippines. Vinny Rico was captured in the Battle of Corregidor by the Japanese and placed in a concentration camp. He knew that the Japanese would steal everything of value, so in a dirty, stinky bandana, he wrapped up his class ring and he wore it around his neck so they would not see that he had anything of value. He is in the concentration camp and he began to wonder, I wonder whatever happened to my buddy Bill Hayes. Walked across to the infirmary, infirmary. They had what they called the zero section. That means if you went in here, you have zero chance of survival. You're not going to live. So he walked up to the barbed wire fence and he began to call out, Bill Hayes! There's Bill Hayes in there. He said he was horrified when a walking skeleton came towards him. It was Bill. He used to weigh 160 pounds. He weighed 70 pounds now. Suffered for months from malnutrition and dysentery and tropical diseases like beriberi. He's, he's looking at this. And Vinny undid his bandana. And he handed his class ring through the fence. And Bill said, save it for your family. We both know that I'm not going to make it. And Vinny said, no, I, I want you to have this ring. Maybe you could bribe a guard. Get some food, get some medicine. He took it and that's exactly what he did. He found a sympathetic guard. He showed him the ring. The guard said, is it valuable? He said, it's very valuable. 
The Japanese guard took it. The next day he threw in a packet of medicine to stop the diarrhea. And he began in succeeding days to give him some fruit and extra rice. And Bill lived. He survived the war. After the war, he was reunited with Vinnie, and in gratitude, he went and got the exact replica of the class ring, and he brought it in a case one day, and he gave it to him in gratitude, and Vinnie began to weep, and he said, I can't wear this. It used to be a status symbol. It used to be a piece of jewelry, but he said, I bought my friend's life with this. He said, it's like it's holy. I can't wear it as a piece of jewelry now. I've been looking all this week. Our brothers, here is Patrick Naomi, Frank Bonaventura, Evgeny Yusinov, all these men from the nations. And I'm looking, you know what? We have gathered in conferences over the years and we have brought our wallets and our checkbooks. What could you do with a wallet and a checkbook? What does it represent? It could be clothes, jewelry, electronic toys, vacations, housing. But we were challenged and what was in our wallets and in our checkbooks became holy, it became life. I wonder how many of these brothers from overseas, as they've been reported, how many of them would be saved today if we had not turned the resources that God gave us towards the saving of the families of the earth? How many of them would not even be alive today? Because this is the choice. We can take this and be like the Jews. It's for us. We're blessed. Or we can take those resources and deliberately aim them for the passion of God, which is the nations of the earth. Theodore Williams of India said these words, we face a humanity that is too precious to neglect. We know a remedy for the ills of the world that is too wonderful to withhold. We have a Christ that is too glorious to hide and we have an adventure that is too thrilling to miss Romans 10 13 through 15 says but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved how then shall they call in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let's bow our heads.